um, if available for instances and holdings records. Um, again, for V1, this will only contain MARC, but most of us have a lot of MARC metadata that we'll need to manage for a long time. So it seems reasonable to start there. And I'm just going to bring up a larger um, version of this diagram that may be easier for you to look at as we continue. Um, I'd like to take a moment to discuss the benefits of this functional separation of the instance record from the bibliographic record. Um, personally, I see a couple of core benefits. Um, first is that staff outside of cataloging do not need to know MARC or any other um, underlying metadata format to be able to work with the data in the native folio data format. I'm particularly thinking of student workers who may not be familiar with library specific metadata formats and who may only work in the library for short periods of time. Also, um, once uh, fully is able to handle data in multiple uh, source metadata in multiple formats, it's not required for users across the library to become familiar with each of those formats. They will still only need to be able to um, work with the folio uh, native data model. Second, um, and this one is particularly exciting to me, um, I, I'm very excited about the ability to not have a MARC record when a MARC record is not required. So you don't have to have a source record behind underlying, a rich bibliographic source record underlying um, your inventory data. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of brief records that are created at the point of order or records that are created to circulate things that don't really need rich descriptions, such as keys for conference rooms, laptops, jigsaw puzzles, etc. The presence of so much non-standard MARC um, in our current catalog as to the challenge of maintaining a large catalog. Processes and workflows need to account for the presence of MARC that's not really MARC, and it interferes with our ability to identify records that truly require attention. Removing this requirement will take a significant functional burden off of my institution and I imagine other institutions as well. Of course, this probably means that we'll need to create other workflows and processes for maintaining data in the folio format, as well as whatever other formats we're using. But personally, I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. Again, the choice is up to the institution and even the user as to when a source record will be required. So the model did require mapping between, does require mapping between um, the metadata specific format um, and the folio um, format um, in inventory. Um, we've completed that process for MARC. As a part of that process, SIG members were faced with a number of questions and considerations, such as um, which elements we should display in the instance record and what should our criteria for inclusion be. If the inventory record is meant to be an abstraction that could be mapped from any bibliographic metadata format, then we didn't want it to adhere too closely to MARC, um, even though that's what we were working with at the beginning. We also didn't want to introduce unnecessary complexity um, to a system that's intended to provide more uniform access to the data um, for use by other folio apps or other systems or um, users across the library community. We wanted enough but not too much detail to support workflows across the library. For instance, when I was thinking about our local requirements, my colleagues and I considered the elements that would be required for staff to do their work without needing to access the source metadata record. Activities that we considered when, when going through that process at Chicago were pre-order searching, serials maintenance, serials receiving, those types of activities. We also wanted a model that would incorporate RDA vocabularies, such as for resource types and formats, but that does not preclude the use of other controlled or local vocabularies. Um, and hopefully you'll see how we address some of these questions and concerns in just a few minutes during the um, demonstration. As a final note, um, I will say something else about the mapping process. At Chicago, we're actually currently going through um, and, and building a loader to get our data from our current system um, mapped to the Folio format and loaded into a Folio instance. Um, and uh, it's actually, it's really exciting opportunity to test the data model and just work through the processes. But this illustrates that the mapping from MARC to Folio is local, uh, lo it's locally um, customizable. We're able to make decisions about what data to map 
and when. And, you know, actually, we just had probably a too long discussion about whether we should map the 310 and the 321 to publication frequency element of folio. Um, FYI, we decided to just map the 310, thinking that was probably sufficient, but we can change it if we need to. As long as there is a folio element present, the mappings from the metadata specific format um, can be set by um, the institution. And it can, you know, be determined by what your institution requires in its own workflows. I want to take a little um, name to introduce a record that is uh, a record type that is new to me. Um, it's the container record. Um, the container record is, in essence, a, it's, it's a package record. It's a local package record. Um, the name was changed to differentiate this local record from the package record in the ERM and eHoldings apps. Um, functionally, the record allows for inventory records to be gathered together um, along with container-specific metadata. Um, order records can be attached to a container record rather than an instance record, which opens up possibilities when purchasing subscriptions, membership, or electronic resources packet, electronic resource packages. Um, so it's no longer required to link an order to a dummy record or a random bibliographic record that describes a single resource within a package. And now analytics and bandwidth. And while it's not a record type, I do want to take a moment to discuss Folio's approach to analytics and bandwidth because I, I think that this is also particularly exciting. Um, so Folio allows new types of relationships between records. Um, and this is something that we just cannot achieve without a lot of um, workarounds in our current system. There will be a um, hierarchical parent-child relationship between instances. For boundless, there will most likely be an instance that is arbitrarily defined as the parent. Um, conventions here may be, vary. For instance, at my institution, we usually make the instance with the item uh, with the real barcode of the parent, and this is normally the first title in a bound with, but the model itself does not prescribe how, um, how local institutions should, should handle this. It can, it can, you can create your own conventions around that. Um, for analytics in this model, you can see um, that the serial or the monographic series record um, is the parent. Um, however, you know, the model really allows for any instance to be a parent and any instance to be a child to support whatever relationships are required in your institution for a given use case. Um, you can also see in the model that there are relationships between the items. This is really still a work in progress and it's a real challenge um, thinking about how to handle um, uh, handing off information about items based on relationships with other items to other apps that need it for management purposes such as circulation or acquisitions. And I'm going to wrap up with a few comments about infrastructure. Um, Charlotte will share details about the inventory and metadata management infrastructure um, in Folio in detail after the demonstration, uh, but I did want to discuss this at a very high level, um, particularly because I've been thinking about inventory personally um, as a hub and uh, as a hub for metadata management activity in Folio. I'm returning to this diagram because I think it nicely illustrates this concept. You can see on, um, on the left you have other Folio apps and that they're interacting with inventory. On the right you have apps that are designed to manage inventory and its source metadata. Um, so the Folio apps don't need to interact with um, the apps for um, all of the, um, the metadata source, um, all of the apps that are used to manage the metadata sources, they will only need to interact again with, um, with inventory. And this makes it less cum cumbersome to integrate new folio apps or new folio data sources. Um, because again, you know, all of them only need to be able to interact with inventory and you won't be stuck in a constant, uh, and a cycle of constantly updating apps or making your apps work with all of the metadata formats um, that you have as source metadata. 
Um, as we were preparing this presentation, either Laura or Charlotte, I don't remember who, used a phrase that I'm particularly fond of, and I would like to leave this phrase um, with you as we move on to the demonstration. Um, and the phrase is format agnostic for format um, diversity. Um, I've been using format agnostic to de describe inventory for a while, but format diversity is is new to me. But I think it really describes um, how inventory um, how inventory is going to be opening up the possibilities of working with multiple metadata sources in the future. So I think inventory is format agnostic in order to provide for format diversity um, in Folio. And on that note, are there any questions that um, have come up that we should answer before moving on to the demonstration? Uh, we don't have anything open. The only question we received earlier was about what SIG stands for. And so uh, within Folio, there's a bunch of different SIGs or special interest groups. Uh, so uh, Laura, Christy, and Charlotte are part of the metadata management SIG, which is kind of oversees kind of the cataloging aspect of Folio. There's a resource management uh, SIG, which oversees kind of acquisitions and electronic resource management. There's resource access, which is more on the circulation side. And so uh, that, that's what the SIGs are. Uh, I, don't have, I don't think there are any other questions either in the chat or in Twitter or in the Q&A. So I guess we can move on. OK. I just need to share the right screen. <laughs> Okay, hi, I'm Laura Wright. I'm the Serials Cataloging Manager at uh, University of Colorado Boulder, as Eric mentioned, and I'm a co-convener of the Metadata Management SIG. And I have the pleasure of doing the demo today. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments first. Um, one of the benefits of working on this SIG has been the chance to compare workflows with other catalogers at other institutions and also to realize how much our workflows have been shaped by the features and limitations of our existing systems. We've realized that we share many concerns and we also have some varying needs and requirements, which means we've been asking for a lot of flexibility, both within and among the Folio apps. So I'm really excited. Um, let's see if I can drag this in. Are you seeing inventory now? Yes. Yes? No. No, we're okay. still saying. Let me, okay, let me share. <laughs> let me share again. Um, oh no. So Laura, I'll we are to... seeing the inventory in action slide. Yep. No, but we I weren't just need seeing to share. inventory. Yeah, I need to share a different screen. How's that? There we go. Okay, so we are now live in Q3 inventory and fingers crossed it will behave. It was behaving earlier. Um, so because of the need for flexibility and the microservices model Christy talked about earlier and the rapid, rapidly growing number of different data formats, our format diversity that we want to be able to accommodate, this is a really different model than most of us are used to working in. Um, I want to reiterate, the inventory app is where we will view containers and instances, and instances, you can think bibliographic descriptions, and where we'll manage holdings and items. And instances might represent print resources. They could also represent ebooks, e-journals, streaming video, laptops, keys, umbrellas, and anything really a library wants to describe and keep track of locally. And inventory will also support fast ads from CircDesk for materials that needed quick on the fly records, as well as from acquisitions at point of order. And as Christy also mentioned, the editing of the, bibliograph the bibliographic descriptions is going to depend on the source of the data. So an instance that's based on a marks, mark record can be edited in the MarkCat app or in another external mark editing tool if you choose. Um, so while we might be viewing bibliographic data based on multiple different data formats, we are managing it all here in the same place in inventory. And if we choose to, we could discard the original format and save all our local records in inventory's format. 
I also want to mention before I start playing here that for version one, there will be authority records and related functionalities in MarkCat, but not in inventory. And a separate Folio Authorities app is slated for future development. So in my current role, I usually create original Mark bibliographic records outside my local system, usually an OCLC connection client. And what I'm going to demonstrate today will be some of the tasks that I would need to then perform in my local system after I had created and exported those records. First, I'm also going to show how to create and edit instance records directly in inventory. And I'll start with some of the searching, filtering, and faceting options. So we have search here that these should not be very surprising options here for basic searching. I'm going to select title. Now I'm going to scroll down to our first filter option, which is resource type. And this is one of the things Christy also mentioned. Some of our default vocabulary in inventory comes from RDA, which is resource description and access and resource type is one of them. Resource type comes from the terms used for the RDA element content type, also known to catalogers as 336. I'm going to select text here. Um, we chose this in part because these fields already exist in many of our records and they've already been translated into a number of different languages. So I'm going to scroll back up and do a title search. Uh, And what I did here, I intentionally included an incomplete terms. So I searched for concepts of fa. So you can see that Folio supports this kind of partial text entry. And you might've no also noticed that it was doing predictive searching as, as I typed. Um, so I anticipate this actually being a really speedy search. Um, and then as Christy mentioned, search on the left, we have a results list. If we had multiple results, we'd have multiple results showing up in the middle pane and on the right, we have the instance record. And in the far upper right here, you'll see the view source button. So in this case, we can see our source, metadata source is mark. So if we view source, we're going to view mark. So this is not an editing interface. This is just a view of the mark from the mark storage. And the MarkCat app is still being, being developed, but the integration is going to be similar to this. There'll be an edit mark record button if the source is mark. It'll open up the same record in MarkCat and the MarkCat interface is not going to look like what you're seeing right now. It's going to look like most of the other Folio apps. There's a similar look and feel for all of them. So it'll look a lot like inventory. Um, and then in the MarkCat app, there'll also be a return to inventory button. So from the user perspective, it really won't be much different from my current system where we have the options to view summary of bibliographic record and attached records, or we can view a bibliographic record or edit bibliographic data. So I'm going to go back to inventory and just reset. And um, I'm going to pretend that I'm working with native in inventory. And as a side note, I know I'm in inventory because in the upper left here, I see inventory as my active app. And uh, dogs is one of my standard test keyword searches. I think we all have those. Um, and I get two dogs records here. And if I select I like dogs, I can see among other things, the metadata source for this is actually not Mark. So I don't have a view mark button when I don't have a mark record. Um, the edit icon is in the upper left and this is another element that will be standard across Folio apps, the, both the placement of the icon and the icon itself. So if I click edit, I go into the edit mode for the instance record. Um, I will talk a little later about the parent child, which appears prominently here. If I scroll down, and this is going to be true in both edit and view modes, um, similar data elements are grouped together. So we have title data, we have contributors, identifiers, descriptive data, and we can collapse these accordions or expand them. So if you know you don't normally need to work with the data at the top, you can collapse things and get easily get down to the data that you do want to see. 
um, eventually, this hasn't been implemented yet, but eventually the idea is that the system is going to remember a user's usual preferences. So if you always want to go to the bottom first, your, your system will learn that from you. Um, and this, as I said, the, the collapsing and expanding is true in both edit and view. So if I want to create a new record in inventory, I have two ways to do that. I can go over here and I can copy the instance. This would copy the existing instance and then I could start editing from there. And I think that's probably a way a lot of us are used to creating new records. And I can also create a new record from scratch just by clicking on new instance. You can see this interface is the same as we saw for editing an existing record. Um, I'd like to point out in this interface that we have select, we have um, separated out, you'll see here mode of issuance, so I can say this is a monograph, from resource type, so maybe I have a map and it would be a cartographic image and that format would be a sheet. Uh, and then there's another element that is not shown here yet called nature of contents, but we've separated all of those out. And I think this allows for a lot more useful faceting and filtering, not only for library staff, but if, uh, potentially for our users in discovery. Um, so I could save this, or if I close, I decide I've made a terrible mistake, I just want to start over, I can close without saving but it won't allow me to close without saving without telling it that I really want to do that. Uh, so now I'm going to do another title search and I stole this title from a coworker who said it was a former coworker's favorite serial title, Concrete Abstracts. Um, and I've just created a sort of dummy record that we can play with here. And you can see if I scroll down we have an instance record, but we have no other records associated with this instance. So I'm going to go to the bottom here and select add holdings and I'm going to add holdings. I'm going to give this a location. I'm going to give it, I'm not going to give it a temporary location. I have that option. If this were electronic, I could select the platform and enter a, um, a link. I'm going to give it a call number. We like to have those. And then I'm going to add a holding statement. And in this case, we have complete run of this title. Now, just like with bibliographic data, if I am using mark holdings, I would be doing the editing of the holding statement or the creation of the holding statement in the mark editing environment and then importing that into Folio. We are right now going to be a library that does not do mark holdings or maybe got to stop doing mark holdings. <laughs> so I now have a holdings record. If I go back to my summary display here, you can see I have a holdings record. Um, I don't know who would put this type of title in popular reading, but there we have it. And um, since I have a holding statement, I can now add an item record. And this interface should be starting to look really familiar. Uh, pretty much all of our interfaces will look very similar. So once you have become comfortable with one app in Folio, you should be fairly comfort comfortable with using any of them that apply to your work. Uh, so, this is a very similar process. Um, I'm going to select a material type. And the material type is actually a field that the resource access SIG has defined. It's not related necessarily to the bibliographic resource and format. Um, and I should note here also up at the top, you can see we clearly have the title displayed, we have the holdings information, location, and call number. And in the item record, those lo the location and call number will be inherited if they are not specifically um, entered as different in the item record. So I'm going to just create an item for volume one, which was 1977. 
And I'm going to add a note. Um, I'm going to create my item. Oh, and it won't let me create an item without a loan type, which is nice. I'm sure my circulation colleagues <laughs> will appreciate that. So now back in the summary view, we see we have holdings and we have an item. We could add another item if we need to. We can add another holding statement if we have this in another location. So I'm going to talk next a little bit about the bound with an analytics model. Christy mentioned it earlier. Um, these materials can be really challenging to display and to manage. Uh, the library I work in currently is a US federal depository, and we sometimes have hundreds of short monographic documents that have been bound together. Um, and the model that the members of the MMSIG and developers have come up with, I think solves this, these problems in a relatively elegant way. And more importantly, it's a way that is going to make these things clearer to our end users. Uh, so I'm going to do another title search. And if I can spell it, it will find. Okay, so this is the instance and I'm going to go into the edit mode because it's easier to see this in edit. What I'm looking at is right here where it says monographic series. It's a little clearer to see here where it says parent instance. Um, and so we're viewing here a monographic series. There are other options. I know your library may not bind individual titles in a series together, but let's, if for this example, imagine that that's what we've done. And the other thing to note is right now, this not very friendly um, identifier is showing up here, but very soon that is going to be the title of the related instance, which will be much easier to make sense of for a human. So this is an instance that is a child and has a parent. So it's got a parent listed here. And if I go back and do a search for my series title, same thing, I'm going to open this in the edit mode just so you can see it more clearly. This is the parent and it has three children. And in this case, they are all in this monographic series. If they were bound with, we could select this. As with many other fe uh, features in Folio, eventually these relationships will be customizable. A library can make up their own to suit their use cases for this hierarchical model. So that this model, as Christy already mentioned, um, can be used, used for a, to solve a variety of challenges, series, article level records within a volume, et cetera. And finally, I'm going to need to unshare for a moment and go back to our PowerPoint. So I'm going to unshare and reshare. And skip through. So this is a feature that is not appearing yet in the current version of Folio, and it's this paired or grouped values model that we have been setting up for instance records, holding records, and item records. Um, an example of this would be if I'm entering a note, what I will have is a drop-down menu that will give, give me options to select for the type of note, and then I'll have a paired field where I'll put the text that's the contents of the note. Um, this background image is a very rough sketch that one of our MM SIG members did to show our designers. And this is a great illustration of how Christy talked about a little, the way we often work. And the designers will ask us questions about what we need, and they'll often suggest more efficient ways to do what we need to do. Then we look at mockups, uh, and those are often drawn on the fly by the designers as we tell them what we think we would like and what we think we would like it to look like. Um, and then we usually have very lively discussions and the designers tolerate them pretty well considering how many of us are still trying to learn to not speak Mark. Uh, this paired or grouped because we might have more than two elements here. This concept will apply to other fields. For example, we're going to use this for links where we might want to have 
uh, not just a link type in the URL, but we also might want to have what we call the subfield three, the, ma the materials specified, we might want to have a public note. So all of those, those fields will be grouped together and display together. And this bottom image is a, an early wireframe from when we were working with a designer talking about what this might look like. So before I address any questions, I, I want to give a really brief statement about my vision for the future of Folio. And that is I see so many possibilities for the future of library applications designed by people who actually work in libraries. Instead of creating workarounds, we can create and share solutions. It's been really exciting exchanging information with catalogers and metadata librarians from other institutions and from other countries. For example, we learned recently about how libraries in Germany have implemented the RDA element nature of contents, and they're recording that in a mark field 655. And I think this has a lot of potential for better use here in the US. I'm also particularly interested in the possibilities that the container record is going to offer. I work frequently with catalog records for ebooks that are part of e-packages, and the container record's flexible hierarchical structure will allow me to more easily manage the rich individual descriptions in our local catalog and connect them as needed to the package or packages they're part of without having to cram data into Mark. So are there questions that have come up? There's a number of questions. Okay. Let so, me know if I need to go back into inventory. So the first question we have is, will non-physical resources need to have item records or can we have holdings records only for digital online resources? And the answer is they will not need to have item records. You can have them if you want to, but items will not be required if you choose to have instance records for e-resources in inventory. Okay. So the second question is, how many records are loaded into this, I guess, your test instance? Oh, that is, Charlotte might know. I don't actually know. Um, oh, yeah, uh, the uh, Q3, I think it's uh, right now only 251. But we have loaded, uh, at one time, we had uh, 6 million records into the alpha. Uh, later, we had two millions, uh, so um, so we have been up in a larger scale than we have right now in the Q3. And I think I remember searching when there were two million and the speed was similar. So one of the questions is, would it, and I guess this is going back into the demo, would it be possible to <laughs> click on the parent-child instances and go to those records? Yes, there yes. will be uh, links. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, thank you, Charlotte. They will be. I'm looking for my um, stop share so I can reshare. So I can go to that. That's why the developer has this uh, yes. <laughs> ugly uh, UUID right now. Um, so, yes, I just uh, let me go back to the series. So I'm looking right now at the, the record, the instance record for the series, and I can click on the ID that eventually will display as the title, but it will still do the ID search. And I am now seeing that child instance. And then there's a question about the phrase mode of issuance. Is that an RDA phrase? That is an RDA phrase, and that's why we used it. We've tried to use neutral standard vocabulary whenever we can and vocabulary we think will be less likely to change as frequently. Are the reciprocal relationships created automatically, i.e. if you add a parent relationship to an instance, will the parent instance be populated with the child instance information? That is an excellent question and I actually don't know the answer. Do you know that, Charlotte? We might need to. We might need to get back to whoever's asking that. I know that we have in the checkout situ situation. We have uh, discussed how to, um, for instance, if you, yeah, uh, are lending the the, the parent um, um, item 
then the, that title would be very different from if you maybe had done a, a request on a, one of the child instances. Uh, but that's something we we have been thinking about. So will container records be able to link to packages in the in the ERM? That is the idea, not so much that they'll be, well, it's a sort of link. The, the idea is similar to how a record in inventory will be pulling data from a source record. A container record, if it is representing a package in ERM, would actually be pulling that data from ERM and would only be editable in the ERM. So we're always trying to maintain what we call the source of truth. So we have one version of data and there, there's only one place you can edit it. So that's perhaps a convoluted answer to way of saying yes. Can we import records from OCLC connection? We are working on that. There's, uh, there's a, a whole busy subgroup right now working on batch loading capabilities. And then once batch loading capabilities are worked out, the single record editing will be, will be figured out. So the idea will be that we can bring in either multiple records or single records from any of the sources that we routinely work with. Can instant records, instance records always coexist in that mark? Bib frame area. So, so I am thinking that if you ever had to migrate out of Folo, you might want those old types of records still available. Yes. <laughs> the, I, Maybe Charlotte. I can come back yes. to that later because then I can show you. Uh, I have a diagram where I show the different storage layers we will have for, uh, for different uh, um, cataloging formats. Yeah. There's a this question. Is, no, sorry, there's a question from Lisa McCall. Yes. Um, if a folio instance record is created in the inventory, is there a way for the data in that folio native format to get imported into a marked bibliographic record? I think that's something that Charlotte will be addressing also in the next section. Yeah. But, but I could also answer it here that, um, um, yes, um, if we have a, a folio instance record with from the beginning, no um, underlying mark record. It could be um, maybe a, a record created uh, in the order app. And then later you want to edit it in the mark editor. Then uh, we will implement um, up in the main header, uh, a drop down menu, menu where you can decide uh, edit, and then it would be the edit in the inventory or edit in mark. And then if you decide to edit in Mark, then it will be converted over and you will be directly linked over to the edit mode in the MarkCat app of this given record. Then you edit your record, you save it. And then from that moment, it will have an underlying record as Mark and it will be uh, uh, locked. Um, uh, so uh, you later not can edit it in the inventory. Because if we didn't do that lock, then we would uh, risk uh, losing data because uh, the mark format is a, a much more detailed uh, format than the inventory uh, instance uh, format is. And then is there planning in the works for creating multiple items, not just one at a time? And I, I am trying to, is, Charlotte, is there a, a Jira or an Epic for that already? Um, no, but we have a UX part story for uh, example, giving uh, bulk edits of, of record and, and uh, of items. And yeah, uh, it, will, it will be possible to uh, not uh, necessarily do it one by one if you need to create 100, for instance, yes. then uh, that would not make sense. <laughs> And this is more of a comment, but it says for testing purposes, it would be nice to have a search for any available items. How about adding this functionality at least to inventory and perhaps even to check out? That is a great comment. <laughs> Thank you. So I think that's, okay. we're all caught up. 
Great. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Then I guess I start to share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, but uh, that actually match very well with uh, the question we just uh, we just uh, ended Laura's session with. Uh, I will talk uh, a little a bit more about uh, what's next uh, for um, the uh, metadata management in Folio. Uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, but very quickly uh, about myself first, because I, I, I had to calculate a little uh, for how long I had worked on this project, and it's uh, 33 months now. So uh, I have been I've been uh, almost uh, participating from the very beginning. Um, and my first baby steps here with the project it was uh, doing a requirement analysis and uh, gathered functional requirements and. Uh, um, yeah, uh, now for uh, um, yeah, uh, more than a year I've been the product owner of inventory and code search. Okay, but I will um, uh, pick up where uh, uh, Christy and Laura uh, left and uh, talk a little about um, the uh, environment uh, for inventory. Uh, and um, Inventory is uh, interacting and uh, are um, um, uh, exchanging data with a lot of other uh, apps. Um, we have, um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, you can see the list here, uh, and it is actually a little bit longer, but this is the, the, the primary uh, list of uh, apps um, we interact with. Um, here to the left in the diagram, uh, you see the inventory app and you now you have heard um, several times that we have these four object types, container, instance, holdings, item, container soon to be, but, um, but uh, we, are, we are almost in development mode uh, on that. But then you, we have uh, inventory storage and it has a separate storage layer for uh, the um, uh, instance records uh, and for holding storage and for item storage. And that is, um, uh, you can see this is uh, touching on uh, uh, Lisa's question. We have this um, conversion going back and forth between the mark storage layer also. So the, um, and in the mark cat app, it's possible to edit the bibliographic record, but also if you want to maintain your holdings record as a, uh, um, um, mark holdings um, in the mark holdings format, um, mark 21 uh, holdings format, then uh, there will be a storage layer for that too. Um, I will not go into uh, very detail of the mark cat app right now, uh, but um, uh, as uh, Christy said, it looks really promising, the work uh, that has been doing uh, lately, and uh, it will probably be uh, uh, a full session in its own to talk more about the MarkCat app, maybe at a future, sh future session here um, in the folio form. Inventory, oh, we have the, the, the more traditional um, cataloging uh, exchange of, of, of the data here. But then um, um, inventory also interact with the codex search, with the uh, EIM app, with the, um, the, the e-holdings app, sorry, and the uh, EIM app, uh, and also uh, with uh, orders. 
check out, check in. That could be um, uh, notes uh, coming from inventory. Uh, it could be uh, notes, maybe non-public notes, public notes. Um, it could be missing pieces. It could be um, information about how many pieces uh, does this um, um, object uh, contain. Uh, for um, uh, yeah, codex search, it's the federated search across the KB and, um, and local uh, collection, in this case inventory. For uh, EIM, uh, the e-holdings app, then um, it can be um, um, the, holding, the library's holdings information um, uh, pushed to um, a local uh, container record in the uh, collection. Um, and here we have done uh, mapping of the uh, data elements in the eHoldings app up against um, our uh, suggested metadata for the container record. Um, so we are um, almost there for that we can uh, have this data exchange between these two apps. And uh, similar, we are in, di in dialogue with the EIM um, subgroup. Um, and yeah, when, when uh, that app is ready, then we will also uh, is, um, establish uh, interaction between the two apps. And then the uh, order app, it's, uh, that's, uh, um, um, yeah, there's uh, there has been um, there's some um, decisions around uh, how to uh, make sure that, um, uh, for instance, uh, that uh, when an order is um, put into the system, then it also needs to be uh, visible in the inventory. So uh, it is um, um, the thing is now that it is mandatory to have. Um, uh, an order record in the inventory um, as soon as you have uh, pushed the uh, order, uh, you have pushed the button to uh, dis uh, and to send the order to the, the vendor. Um, two seconds, I make sure I tell you all the details. Um, uh, so when you push that button uh, and the order is skipped to the vendor, then there will, uh, uh, um, in that um, immediately, there then will be a, um, a brief instance record uh, visible in inventory. You can, of course, decide, is this something you want to suppress for discovery? So it's only visible for staff. Um, that is, um, that's a, a decision the library can do. Um, inventory, uh, it, and this decision goes both for um, if you order um, a print, printed document or you order uh, an electronic document, then there will be this. So if it's an electronic document, then it will be a brief uh, container uh, record in inventory. Um, See, um, if I go back uh, very quickly again to uh, the layer here in the middle, the central uh, generic BIP storage, then there will be no uh, own UI for this piece. It's, a, it's only storage layer. Uh, but if you, so the edit, as in Lisa McCall's uh, question, will happen in MarkCat or and if it doesn't have an underlying mark record, then it can happen in the, um, um, it will be edit of the instance record. Um, please note that um, uh, it's item records are only stored in the inventory app. So um, as it is now, then it's not possible to edit, um, to um, update your, uh, or to create item data in, uh, for instance, uh, the market um, tool. 
if you later uh, um, it's with very tiny, but we have um, worked quite a bit with uh, how uh, are the uh, UUIDs represented in the different um, representation of kind of the same record. Uh, but, but here um, we have how these UUIDs are represented. Um, uh, but if you later take a look at the um, slides, then they you can uh, explore a little bit more. This one um, is a um, um, next step in uh, the uh, data model uh, diagram, uh, which uh, Christy uh, showed. It's um, a diagram we uh, we have borrowed from um, Christian Wilson's presentation uh, last week in Italy, um, but here she she gave a, a presentation about uh, BibFrame and uh, the possibility of having of um, uh, implementing uh, BibFrame in um, Folio. But you can see right now we are uh, etablating uh, we are uh, establishing. Um, um, the market with a generic BIP storage uh, to um, um, as uh, for the flow of the record into inventory, but very similar to BIP frame as another um, cataloging format, we will establish its own generic BIP frame storage. So we, we can we can keep it separate. So there will not happened um, happen um, uh, several conversions. It will be from the original format going through the generic BIP frame storage into inventory uh, for each of... Um, so we, of course, will have data loss from the MARC, the very detailed MARC format going to in, uh, inventory, but we will not have um, going through mark, bib frame, inventory, or something else. It, we are keeping it very strictly. So they exist side by side. And looking a little bit more ahead than, uh, yeah, this drawing can be really um, crowded to look at, but we imagine that we can have uh, an EAD editor. We imagine we can have a Dublin Core editor. We imagine we can have, yeah, whatever editor um, uh, uh, the libraries uh, will, um, um, uh, yeah, request to have uh, uh, added to um, to this um, metadata environment. Then I will uh, go back and uh, tell a little bit more what uh, we are up to right now and uh, what will happen in the near future. Um, so a little back to reality. Uh, what are we doing um, this week, this month? Um, we are, uh, Laura demoed the Q3 and that's the official release will, uh, will be next week. Um, um, I personally has uh, thought of this uh, Q3 release as the dress rehearsal because uh, in three, mo three months we will have the Q4 release which is the first release where we will have um, a library, a Chalmers library also to uh, migrate into Folio. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it has been some really busy weeks for all uh, involved POs, developers, etc., to wrap up, make sure that we had final work uh, and the release were yeah, ready to be rolled out. For inventory, we have specifically uh, focused on uh, following four UX part stories. We have um, um, yeah, done first part of the um, implementation of um, 
uh, identified elements, uh, which was uh, missing elements, we call it as a, as a working term, but it was uh, elements uh, we didn't implement for the alpha uh, version, but uh, while working, um, discussing in the MMSIC and also uh, the huge work done um, in the data migration subgroup uh, and uh, where Christy Thomas was the lead of, uh, all looking at um, uh, the, um, the, the different systems uh, where from all the participants' uh, libraries are coming from, looking at their uh, existing data and mapping it up against uh, inventory and identifying, okay, what what are we missing still? What do we need uh, inventory to uh, um, meta elements we need to include uh, into uh, inventory? This work has started and um, we still have um, small tweaks to do on the instance record. We have uh, update of the holding and uh, item record also to do. And then uh, uh, we have um, implemented and which uh, Laura showed uh, linking to the source record. That was the mark record um, she displayed. Oh, sorry, I need to go back. Um, now I get, how do I go get back? Anyone who, never mind. Um, I can see it here for one. And we implemented the link and we have also uh, stored uh, the uh, local records. The next uh, slide is then the pipeline. Uh, that is uh, what are we planning for, to do for Q4 and for um, the next, uh, next two uh, releases, Q1 2019 and Q2 uh, 2019. Uh, this list is actually, uh, right now I just did a screen dump of the top ones, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a longer list. Um, but for the, um, um, the MMSIC, then we are, uh, we are working with uh, all the uh, stories where, which has this, where it's, it's open. We, we have the, the idea of what to implement. But then when we go into uh, the analysis phase, it's here we have all the, the, um, the talks. We uh, establish the working groups uh, to um, define more in details, the requirements, the functionality, um, the pain points, etc. Uh, and we also, uh, in this phase, uh, write up um, uh, the um, <clears throat> the the UX wireframes um, and we involve the UX designers. When the story then is um, analyzed is complete, then it's um, then all the groundwork is done and uh, the, it's ready for the developers to pick up the story, start development, um, maybe come back to uh, to me as PO or um, and if there is question, if there is uh, things uh, uh, need to be uh, clarified, um, but again, this is uh, the iterative process. So, the goals for uh, yeah uh, inventory and for. Uh, um, for folio um, as a whole was to be able to be so flexible so um, um, we can support um, needs coming in from Germany, coming in from uh, uh, the US libraries, coming in from libraries in Asia. So, and, and I'd say that as more we work with um, our um, uh, data model and our uh, architecture for um, where how uh, inventory is fit into the the full environment etc um, I, I yeah um, uh, it's um, it's it's, it's um, 
on this word. It's um, yeah. It it it. I just get um, 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 I I can see that the ideas we had initially that we uh, we can still embrace new ideas and uh, we haven't we 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 that flexibility that was one of the very very first thoughts we are implementing that so looking ahead then we will um, be able to uh, add multiple formats add uh, multiple different editors and um, uh, back in January, uh, back in Durham, then uh, we talked about Bitframe uh, maybe coming up as uh, something for the future. Um, but um, it was it it back then. It seems like maybe uh, looking one two years ahead, but uh, uh, um, it's like uh, things are getting faster than uh, we maybe even had. Um, had, uh, imagined. Uh, we will uh, uh, be focusing uh, um, on the advanced search, both within inventory but also across all apps. Um, it, it will be possible to uh, search data in inventory and then also mix it with uh, data from uh, other apps. Um, the uh, data flow integration um, we are um, that um, yeah it, it we are talking about this the seamless uh, integration uh, between apps um, it we will um, um, data will be uh, pushed it will be mirrored etc it will not be redundant data uh, uh, troublesome for the users, etc. We are, um, and that's also uh, where, for instance, it's it's um, um, yeah um, so promising when we have done this mapping up against the order app and the inventory, the data elements uh, that we can we can see these um, mapping fitting uh, nicely together, and also the e-holdings app and the um, uh, inventories uh, container record. Also here we have, um, um, yeah, things fit nicely together. And then um, uh, my last uh, point here, uh, which kind of reflects back to, uh, I said that Bibframe suddenly became uh, not a uh, distant future, but near future that uh, Chalmers um, have uh, decided uh, that they uh, will go for a migration uh, uh, here from uh, January 2019, where they will uh, leave Mark behind and uh, do a, a full transition to using Bibframe as their metadata editor. Uh, Chalmers has, uh, in, will in collaboration with uh, Libris, the Swedish um, Union catalog, uh, do um, a, a Bibframe converter, uh, mapping from Bibframe up to um, the um, uh, inventory uh, metadata format. So that is, um, yeah, again, it, it shows um, uh, how this architecture can be um, uh, used in so many ways. And it, it has, um, um, yeah, uh, it can um, embrace all uh, the, the new ideas uh, and all the things we have envisioned. But of course, all of us, we were uh, a little, um, yeah, uh, could we live up to it? Can we, can we really make it? But um, this is, uh, this, this is really exciting that uh, uh, these plans uh, of Chalmers. Finally, uh, I have uh, collected a list of um, uh, links to where you can read more. There's the uh, folio inven inventory working uh, where um, the document uh, with the definition Christie uh, show, but that's um, kind of the 
master document for what is folio, um, is in, uh, what is inventory in folio. There's a document about the, the holdings record and uh, the idea that we need to have both holdings record in folio format, but also support the Mark 21 format holdings um, format. There's some more reading about the container records, reading about the inventory market, and uh, uh, a working document about uh, storage and uh, IDs, the uh, UUIDs. Finally, um, I here have listed uh, um, our main uh, Slack channels, uh, which are, um, um, yeah, you are very welcome to, uh, to join. Um, and the metadata management uh, Slack channel is uh, the one for, the primary one for uh, the MMSIC, but we have also uh, um, channels for the subgroups and for the working groups. That was the end of um, my part of the presentation. Um, I'm happy to take questions and thank you for listening. So we do have a few questions. Um, uh, in reference to your slide that's titled Metadata Management Environment. Um, Let me see uh, if I can come back to it. Two sec. This one, yeah. So the question is, where is the source of truth? Can it be identified in this diagram? Yeah, the source of truth is this yellow, the central generic BIP storage. That's the source of truth. And then we have a question, will the slides be made available? This is something we hadn't really discussed. I'm not quite sure if we can include that yeah. somehow. Then you can use the links for the um, read more documents. Right. Um, I think at a minimum we can link to them from the YouTube channel, YouTube uh, archived recording. And then will records of items formally loaned be deleted in inventory? Uh, so this discussion has evolved to copy the title of inventory records to loan records in case the inventory record vanishes. This way statistics still shall have access to the title, but massive du duplication is required. Are there other possible approaches? Um, I'm, I'm not uh, quite sure if this has been discussed uh, with uh, the um, RA sick, um, but um, I think that would be a very relevant question to take back to the RA sick and the PO for uh, loan. So, are there any other questions? And I think we can wrap things up. Um, so this concludes today's Folio Forum. You can continue the conversation at the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org, and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the Open Library Environment's YouTube channel. If you have feedback on this forum or have an idea for a future forum, please contact the forum facilitators at facilitators at olay-lists.openlibraryfoundation.org. Our next Folio Forum is tentatively scheduled for October 10th on the topic of single tenant consortia plans. So be on the lookout for that announcement. Thank you to Christy, Laura and Charlotte and to everyone who asked questions and added comments. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.